Let's just stay standing for a second. Um, what a night, man. Yeah, this is so cool. This is good stuff. This is good, good, good. Um, it was my honor uh, to get to introduce our speaker tonight, uh, Jesse Reeves. And I wanna tell you just a little bit about him. He told me backstage, make me look cool. I said, I'll do my best. Here's the deal with Jesse, just to let you know the kind of guy he is, kind of man that he is. He would be so happy if I introduced him like this. Jesse loves the Lord. He's a husband, he's a father, he's a bass player in a 90s country band, and he is a Texan-loving cowboy. He would be so happy if I introduced him like that. <laughs> but let me tell you a little bit about this guy, and then I'm gonna turn him loose on you. He has lived a life to this day that has wildly accomplished. As a musician, he has toured and traveled, led worship, for close to two decades all over this world with Chris Tomlin playing bass in his band. That's pretty amazing. Um, as a songwriter, he has written some of the most influential worship songs, I would say, the last 20 years in, in this modern worship movement. Um, song, Our God, you might know that one. How Great Is Our God, Indescribable, just to name a few. And here's what's amazing about that and why that's important, because he has been a part of putting vocabulary in your mouth, in my mouth, to help us express how we feel about God and what God means to us and who God is. So that's amazing. Thank you, sir. <laughs> attached to his name are Dove Awards. If you don't know what that is, that's like the Christian Grammy. He has Dove Awards attached to his names, and he actually has real Grammys attached to his name as well, which is pretty amazing. If you catch him, ask him to tell you the story of when he met Chris Martin, the lead singer of Coldplay, at the Grammys. It's one of the best stories I've ever heard. Um, he was a part of planting Passion City Church with Louis Giglio and that team in Atlanta. If you've heard of that church, I mean, come on. What is this life that this guy has led to this point? It's incredible. But here's what I believe. I believe this wholeheartedly with everything that I am, that what? What his wife and he, the plow that they have put their hands to in this current state of their life is going to be the most impactful, most influential, and the greatest legacy that he will leave on this planet, separate from being a good husband and a good father. He has planted um, a house church in Austin, where they live, Texas, um, and it's becoming a network of house churches and the ground that they are taking and the life change that they are seeing in people's living rooms is extraordinary. And it's something over here that and on our coast is wildly inspiring to what we're doing. He's becoming a great friend of us, a great friend of our house here at Seacoast. So if you would, let's give him a good low country welcome. Everybody, Jesse Reeves, come on. Y'all sit down. That was absolutely painful for me. <laughs> Are y'all okay? I'm serious. I hated everything that Nate just did, so let's just clear the stage. I'm not Jesus. I know I look like him. <laughs> but Jesus is here. And I stood back in the back right there, First of all, London gave me 15 minutes. I can't say anything in 15 minutes, so I'm just gonna have to go fast. I stood back in the back and I just prayed, God, who's in this room? Who is in this room? And I felt like that there's people in this room right now that you're on your last leg and you've heard about this amazing thing that God's doing on first Wednesday here at Seacoast and you came in the door and you didn't know that you were walking into a live recording and you're like toying with like, should I leave? Don't leave. Because what you came for is coming. We're gonna have a time here in a minute where you're gonna pray, get prayed for and you're gonna meet the Holy Spirit. I believe that. I think there's the other side of that. I think there's people that walked in here for a live recording and you're a London Gatch fan and you got a London Gatch tattoo <laughs> and you don't know that the Spirit of God is gonna intersect your life tonight. That's, that's two. We've got young people, we've got old people. 
We have people that have been coming since the first Wednesday and you've seen God heal people and you've prayed for God to heal you and you've prayed for God to move in your life and it just hasn't happened yet. I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand, but I know that there's people in there like this. And then you got people that came the first time and you, and you did meet God and he changed your life and he did a miracle in your life and you've been coming every time for just a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little bit more and you're like, like, a, like a self-feeder. Does that make sense? Does everybody kind of feel something in there? Okay, we're all on the same page and I came here from Austin, Texas to tell you that for every one of you, there's a word from God. I have a word from God. When somebody tells you they have a word from God, it needs to come from the word of God. Let's just, uh, let's just let that sit right there. When London asked me to do this and she told me, first of all, y'all don't know, maybe you do, what God is doing here is spreading all over the country. I don't know if you know that. In Austin, Texas, where I live, people are talking about what God is doing at Seacoast. Okay, I just, hang on, hang on. I think we can come in here and we just, it just becomes normal that you have Brandon Lake and London Gatch and, and Nate and Micah and like, this isn't normal. <laughs> just so you know. And on top of that, there are leaders that are praying for this body and the Holy Spirit is showing up and doing miracles and that's not happening everywhere, but it's happening in here. So you have to ask, why here, why now, and what are we supposed to do with it? If you're not asking those questions, something's wrong. Why us, God? It's not happening everywhere, but it's happening here. I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell you something. If you have a Bible, you probably didn't bring a Bible, but I bet you brought a phone. <laughs> I just wanna give you a quick word from Mark chapter two. And this is a story, if you've been in church for more than like five minutes, you've heard this story. But this story's been absolutely blowing my mind. This is the story where the dudes bring the, there's four guys and they carry a paralytic guy on a, on a pallet and they climb up on the roof and lower him through. Do y'all know this story? Okay, good, your pastor just got a gold star. <laughs> so don't tune out. Because I want you to see a couple things in this that have just come alive to me. I'm just gonna read it. It's Mark chapter two, because I believe that there's power when we read the word of God over people. Okay, this is the only thing right here that God promises will not return void. Everything else you hear is, is my opinion. But this is God's word. So just, just let it fall on you for a second. I'm just gonna read 12 verses. Mark chapter two. And when he returned, that's Jesus, to Capernaum, after some days it was reported that he was at home. And many were gathered together so that there was no more room, not even at the door. And as he was preaching the word to them, Jesus knows that there's power in the word, by the way. As he's preaching the word to them, and they came bringing to him a paralytic man by four men. And when they could not gear, get near the house because of the crowd, they removed the roof above him, and when they had made an opening, they let down the bed on which the paralytic lay, and when Jesus saw their faith, he said to the paralytic, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, did anybody pick up on a word in there? What was it? Okay, who's they? Oh, it's a true question. <laughs> they are the people from, that carried over from chapter one. You gotta read this book in context. In chapter one, Jesus is walking along the Sea of Galilee and he calls Peter and Andrew, who were fishing, to come follow him. And then he calls James and John, the sons of Zebedee, to come follow him, and they follow him, and the four of them are walking along, five of them, four plus one, there's five of them, and they're walking along, and they walk to a town called Capernaum, because that's where Peter lives. Are you with me? 
That's why they were in Capernaum in chapter one, because they go to Peter's house, and Peter's mother-in-law is sick, and so Jesus touches Peter's mother-in-law, and the fever goes away, and the word gets out, and all of a sudden, by evening time, it says, I'll just read it to you, Chapter one, verse 32, the evening at sundown, they brought to him all who were sick and oppressed by demons, and the whole city gathered outside the front door. And he healed many who were sick with various diseases and cast out demons. What I believe is that the they were there in chapter one. And they had a friend that was not there in chapter one that was a paralyzed man and they saw Jesus do something amazing and they had a responsibility. Hello? If you've seen Jesus do something amazing here, you now have a responsibility. And the responsibility is for you to be the they and bring the them in here. Okay, there shouldn't be the same number of people here that there were on week one. And if there are, we're missing the point. Because when Jesus does a miracle in the Bible, it's never for the person, solely for the person that's receiving the miracle. It's so that all may see. Are you with me? So that's the reason when Jesus is doing something here, it's not necessarily just for you to be healed in here, it's for you to go out there and bring them in here. And part of that responsibility, these people got there and there wasn't room inside the house, so they were like, well, that's not gonna stop us from getting you to Jesus. So they climbed up on, on the roof. By the way, they're back at Peter's house. Have you ever thought about that? They're at Peter's house and they dig a hole in the roof and they lower their friend through. Some of you need to remove the ceiling and the barrier that's keeping those people out of here. Some of you have people in your lives that don't have cars. Remove the ceiling, go pick them up, and bring them to Jesus. Are you with me? Some of you have friends that are addicts. I've got lots of friends that are addicts. You need to remove the ceiling. You need to get into their lives, get them help, so that you can bring them to Jesus with a sober mind and have the Holy Spirit change their life. Every one of you have a them in your life and you need to be the they. Does that make sense? If you're not, I gotta tread lightly on this. If you're not, there's a chance that the Holy Spirit will move on. Read it. The Holy Spirit's like the wind. He moves back and forth and nobody knows where he's coming from or where he's going. But if you have a body of people that are being the they and bringing the them in here, he tends to camp out. Do y'all wanna just always talk about that first, first Wednesday? Just keep talking about, man, that first Wednesday, man, we were here till two o'clock in the morning. God was doing amazing stuff. Are you content with that? No. They should all go that long. They should go for a week. Cause you just go, you bring somebody in, you go, oh, I just thought about somebody else. You sit right here, I'm gonna go get somebody else. <laughs> keep carrying them in, keep carrying them in. Place gets full, <laughs> come through the roof. Okay, are you with me? That's the intro, how far do I go? I got four minutes left. Is that counting backwards or frontwards? It's counting backwards. All right, stick with me one second. I just want you to, I want you to get this. So they bring this guy. This guy is paralyzed. He's laying on a mat. And they tell him, all you have to do is meet Jesus and he's gonna heal you. What do you think this guy wants more than anything from Jesus? Healing, right? So they take him up on the roof, dig a hole, lower him down on a mat. Picture that. Here he comes down on a mat and to the crowd. He's crippled. And when Jesus saw their faith, he said, son, your sins are forgiven. Hang on. Is that what that guy wanted? No, 
He wanted to be healed. But Jesus dealt with his heart. So for those of you that are here and you're frustrated, there's a chance that Jesus is trying to deal with your heart first. Just put yourself in there. I mean, we've heard the story too many times. Dude is dangling on a mat. Listen to what happens. Jesus says, son, your sins are forgiven. Now, some of the scribes were sitting there questioning in their hearts, why does this man speak like this? He's blaspheming. Who can forgive but God alone? And immediately, Jesus, perceiving in his spirit that they were questioning him, said to them, why do you question these things in your hearts? Which is easier to say to the paralytic, to forgive your sins or to say rise up and walk? Dude is dangling. He's frustrated. He's probably, seriously, strip off all the spiritual stuff. He's probably embarrassed. His friends have said, if we can get you through this hole, you're gonna be able to walk. He's frustrated, he's embarrassed, he's laying there helpless, and Jesus starts a side conversation with the Pharisees, and dude's dangling. It sounds funny, but think about it. There's people in this room that have come for the first Wednesday, month after month after month, and you're just dangling, and you're frustrated. You're saying, God, I'm faithful, I'm showing up. I'm dangling, I'm frustrated. It's embarrassing. I've actually told people that if I go, I'm gonna be healed, and I haven't been healed. Does this make sense to anybody? What Jesus cares most about is your heart. That's his number one priority, is to heal your heart. And it needs to be good enough to hear this over your life. Your sins are forgiven. That needs to be the best news you've ever heard. It's not, my sins are forgiven, great, now help me do something else. No, your sins are forgiven. There's now eternal life. There is now, therefore, no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. That's what Jesus wants to deal with. And you've got the thems in your life, those of you that have felt a touch of God, that maybe they're not physically needing a healing, but they need a savior. And I believe that the reason the Holy Spirit has touched this place is so that these people will go out into this community and bring these people back in to where it's so full that nobody can get in the doors. And so Jesus can save people's souls. Does that make sense? Okay, I see the red numbers. We'll just land the plane like this. He said, what's easier, to say your sins are forgiven or to say, rise, take up your bed and walk? But that you may know that the Son of Man has authority on earth to forgive sins. He said to the paralytic, I say to you, Rise, pick up your bed, and go home. That's how good God is. He's so good that he cares about your heart, and he loves you so much that he's still gonna heal you. Does this make sense to anybody? That's how good our God is. Now watch this, and we're gonna be done. And he rose, and immediately he picked up his bed, and he went out before all of them so that they were all amazed And they all glorified God saying, we've never seen anything like this. That is your response. To say we've never seen anything like this. You go out those doors, you go into Chick-fil-A, no everybody in Chick-fil-A is a Christian already. Go to, uh, I was just trying to think of what's next door. Go into your office and you say we've never seen anything like this. 
The Holy Spirit of God is coming and he's saving souls and he's healing people, come. And this place, I guarantee you, if you start carrying people in here on mass, the Holy Spirit is gonna stay here and just keep working. Does that make sense? So this is, this is what I wanna say to you. Number one, be the they. Number two, if you're frustrated, don't give up. Jesus wants to deal with your heart and he's good enough to heal you too. Don't give up. Does this make sense? The third thing I wanna say is that this is so special, what's happening here, that you need to be thanking God that he has chosen you. And you need to know he's not doing it everywhere. He has chosen you for a reason. And you need to carry that responsibility seriously. Don't be flippant about the presence of God. Carry it responsibly, carry it seriously. And I just feel like the Holy Spirit is just getting started in this room. So this is what I wanna do. I just wanna pray a blessing over you. I want you to receive it. And then I'm gonna bring out uh, Nate and Wes, and we're just gonna have just a little conversation to let them speak over you as well. Everybody, everybody good? Okay, so let's don't all just leave when the live recording's over. We're gonna stay here and do business with the Holy Spirit. Are y'all with me? All right, let me pray for us. Jesus. God, it's just good to say that name over these people. Jesus. Let it rest on you, Jesus, over your life. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that he is Lord to the glory of the Father. So we say, Jesus, thank you for just sending Holy Spirit here to dwell among these people. God, even now, would you be putting people on our hearts that have to come? If we have to put them on a mat and carry them and climb up a ladder and tear a hole through the ceiling, make it our mission to bring people into your presence. And Holy Spirit, I do pray that this is just the beginning of what you're doing at Seacoast. I pray a blessing over these people. I pray courage over these people, confidence over these people, mission over these people and Holy Spirit power in their lives. In the name of Jesus and all God's people said, amen. amen. All right, now, Nate, come on out. Where's Wes? Hey, Wes, I'm Jesse. <laughs> that was authentic right there. I saw him earlier, but I didn't get to meet him. I do know Joshua but it's just about Wes. So, let's have a little conversation. You've been here, y'all both been here since day one of what God's doing here. Tell me what you feel like the Spirit of God is saying to you for what's next. Man, two chapters later in Mark, Jesus says, pay attention to what you hear, and by the measure you use it, it will be measured unto you, and more will be added. So that, that's actually like the thing that was on Jesus' heart following that story. Um, one of the hardest things about being a disciple is the amount of increasing responsibility that we carry. And one of the hardest things, honestly, about praying for the sick is, I mean, it's awesome when it's 
people getting healed and all of that. And every time I've been here, it's been amazing. But also every time I've been here, I go back to my hotel or wherever we're staying and my heart's burdened for the ones that walked away and nothing's changed yet. And, and, and that's the hardest place to not waver and allow the word of God to be the word of God. Allow Psalm 103 to say what it says. He forgives all of your sin. He heals all of your diseases. And to not make excuses for what's going on. I think a lot of times it's in those moments where we actually look to, we look to our theology for comfort and we come up with extra reasons for why something didn't happen. But the reality is that the Holy Spirit is our comforter and we let the word say what the word says. And there's this, there's this tension that we live in where can you be faithful to refuse to change the subject when the going gets tough. And, and I think that that's the, that's the place where God looks at, have you used the measure that you have? Because I'm telling you like, what we have right now is a seed. It is just a seed and if we plant it in the ground and if we're faithful to tend it, and if you're faithful to water it, and if you're faithful to put fertilizer on it, you might go, a day, a week, a year, years. But sooner or later, the right, the coming together of all the elements is gonna happen and that seed is gonna grow, it's gonna grow. And the more seed you put in the ground, the more it's gonna grow. So many of us abandon our seed in the ground. We, we think, we wait a couple days and nothing's happened and we walk away. And, and, but there's this responsibility aspect of it that is, it is hard to carry sometimes, but I think that's the vital one. That's the vital one. Um, and so we are just totally just getting started, just scratching the surface. But this is where the rubber meets the road. It's like, there's, I, I think about the story. You remember when Jesus is, um, after he's fed the 5,000, they're on the boat and the storm happens and, and Jesus calms the storm and, and uh they're amazed that he had that kind of power. And, and in one of the versions of that story, in one of the gospels, is that it actually says that they were amazed because they didn't understand the meaning of Jesus feeding the 5,000. And I love what you said. Seeing a miracle actually makes you responsible to that knowledge. Now, now I've seen Jesus do something. I'm not allowed to be intimidated by cancer anymore. I'm not allowed to be. I have to approach it the same every single time with the same expectation because I've seen Jesus do the miracle before and I have to stay faithful but at the same time stay grateful in that I will be faithful to the commission no matter what happens and I will never change the assignment and if I never see another person healed for the rest of my life, I will never stop praying for the sick because the command is there, you know? Man, that's good. So uh, let's use this as a transition. Speaking of planting seeds, <laughs> let's, let's resort to our, our farmer. <laughs> Nate, uh, honestly, first of all, Wes and I are both outsiders that you've invited in here, so thank you. These are, this is your soil. What, do you, what is on your heart um, to add to that or from the beginning, the goal behind this? I would say, I think there's an invitation that's been placed, you know, proverbially on like a table. There's an invitation that's been set out to become a disciple of Jesus. There may be some of you here, I'm not sure, who are still checking Jesus out. Some of you, I would say you're a believer. Like, I believe in Jesus and I've crossed that line. Some of you, I would call you a follower. I prescribe, I like what it says, we come to church, we're here. But I think as you go down that list, those groups of people get smaller. And then the invitation to a disciple in the Bible, how many? It was a small number. And I think because of the, the sacrifice, the requirement that comes into becoming a disciple. So I think there's an invitation on the table for us 
to be a disciple. And if you look in Acts, look at the disciples. If you look through the Gospels, look at the disciples and look at their lives. Does it mirror your life? That's what, that's what I feel personally. I feel like God has invited me into a, like a disciple kind of thing because I can look at the sacrifices they were making. I can look at the confidence and authority that they walked in and I can look at parts of my life and it does not match. And so I'm like, okay, God, you're inviting me to be a disciple, actually. And I think there's more for me to go. And I would say the same for our whole body is this year has been amazing. And I think leading up to this year, I prayed for the, I prayed for like the moment, you know what I mean? I prayed for the, the service. And I'm realizing it's not that, it's just, that's just like a, it's the, you know, when you're igniting a, a fire, those are just the sparks, you know what I mean? So I think that those two things, I think we are just, uh, Pastor Gray, we were talking and you said, you were talking to somebody and you were like, we're the slowest growing revival or something like that, <laughs> that we've seen yet. And I think that's it, I think we all have this picture in our mind that a revival is this explosion moment in a service and we never leave and people are getting weird and crazy, you know, like all these kind of things. And I just think, sure, yes, but also um, I think it's much, and I want it to be, and I know it's the, same, it's the heart of our pastors as well, to make it, it's a long yeah. lasting revival yeah. forever. Um, in you, that you're being revived, yeah. and then you are also reviving. Uh, that's, to me, that's where I feel like we're at. And I feel like it's just, God has so graciously been like, here's the invitation. Come on. That's good. I think we're probably out of time. It's okay, you got one more thing? No, but what I want to do is, what both of y'all talked about just reminded me of Acts 4, after Peter and John got thrown in prison. I read the same thing yep. two minutes ago. Are you serious? I read the same thing two minutes ago. Well, I felt like, yeah, so read it. Then the Holy Spirit has a word for us. I'm going to stand up. On that Thursday, too, too. Yeah. <laughs> you read this too? I preached it Thursday. That chapter. Receive. So they get out of prison, and, and they go back to, the, to their friends, to their little home group, and they say, hey, y'all aren't gonna believe this, we just got thrown in prison for preaching the gospel, and it says everybody rejoiced. And they lifted up their voices and they started singing this spontaneous song, Sovereign Lord, who made the heavens and the earth. It's this amazing song. But listen to their prayer. They never pray, God, take this away from us. God, you know, change our circumstances, whatever. This is what they said. And now, Lord, look upon their threats and grant to your servants to continue to speak your word with all boldness while you stretch out your hand to heal and signs and wonders are performed through the name of your holy servant, Jesus. That's my prayer for you. Yeah, that's good. Like they're, like they're saying, Nate says be a disciple. You pray for boldness. You go into the community with boldness. You find the people that need to be carried in here. You go out with boldness speaking the name of Jesus and he will do the rest. Amen. All right, uh, I wanna invite the team back up. We're gonna do some more. I wanna pray for us. Actually, I wanna, Wes, would you pray? Yeah. I've prayed, Jess has prayed. I would love for you to pray as we transition. Yeah. There you go. Yeah, Heavenly Let's Father, we, we adore your son, Jesus. Yeah. And at the end of the day, it's about the, the desperation to, to tear the roof off the place is, is more for me, it's more about being with you than anything else, God. Let me never be so, um, I never want my attitude to be, what have you done for me lately? I just wanna be in your presence. I just wanna catch another glimpse of who you are. I, I just want you to have a comfortable throne on my praise tonight. So Father, we just, once again, we thank you for your presence. We thank you that it's promised to us. We thank you that there's, there's actually nothing we have to do to conjure up your presence that, that you said that where two or three are gathered in agreement, you're there with them. You said that you are enthroned on our praise. So God, we acknowledge that you are here tonight and we just worship you, we lift you up and we thank you for the opportunity to do so in Jesus' name.
Amen. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Fact check. I'll do this one. So we're going to do some more songs. We're going to worship. Um, response stations will be open. So Seacoast do like Seacoast knows how to do uh, as we continue. Love you guys.